So for all of us this morning, we are going to leave this place with a clear biblical understanding of why we as Christians go to church. So in our first study in our series, we asked the question, why church? And we'll see this progression. And I hope you can file this away. And if you're taking notes, if we're going from left to right, you'll see this progression of have to, need to, want to. Having to, needing to, wanting to. So let me ask you this question right off the bat. Have you ever personally wondered why you go to church? Why do I go to church? Maybe you'd respond, uh, you know, I go to church because, uh, like, well, actually, I've always gone to church. And that's just something, you know, my parents go to church. And then, you know, I go to church. And my week kind of feels weird if I don't go to church. Or maybe you'd say, you know, I started following Jesus. And I thought that was, like, kind of the right thing to do. Where now I, I'm, sub- right? Aren't I supposed to go to, go to church? You know, uh, I'm not really sure exactly. Well, for some people, going to church is a drag. It is a drag. It's like, it's obligatory or purgatory. You know, it's, it's boring. And the best thing that they could ever hear on a Sunday morning is when the pastor says, and in closing, and they're like, yes, great time at church today. I'm so excited for it. For other people, going to church is their spiritual lifeline. It's friendship and support. It's family. It's the place where they feel refreshed and where they feel strength and where they feel safe, where they feel loved. And if they've been away for a while, it's like coming home, church. So as we start off, let's ask the question, what is church? Point number one, what is church? Well, the word church in the Greek is the word ekklesia. Okay, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to pronounce ekklesia. Basically, this word is defined as a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place in an assembly. Now, as we've been studying through Acts, Paul, as you would see, was very customary for him. He would go into a city, preach the gospel, people would get saved, and then he would gather those believers together, and that was the church. Gathering together, organized meetings for them to hear about the word of God. So, As we see this happening, this organized gathering of believers, which many of us here are today, this is what church is. This is how it starts, a group of people. Church is not the building. The church is the people or the people that follow Jesus. So when you say, hey, I'm going to church today, what you're really saying is I'm going to go to the place where I'm going to be with other people who follow Jesus. I am going to join together with them. That's what it means to go to church. Now, the church didn't come up with the term the church. Jesus actually did. He was the first person to ever use the word church in the Bible. So we see that Jesus builds the church. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church belongs to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus uses that possessive, that possessive uh, pronoun, my, to show us who the church belongs to. But remember, the church is the people. So Jesus is saying he would build the Christian. And in essence, build the group of Christians that hell would not be able to overcome. He builds the church. He's working in your life. He's molding you and shaping you more and more into his image. So Jesus created the church. He builds the church. Jesus is the head of the church. In Ephesians 1, verses 22 through 23, it says, And he put all things under his feet, speaking of Jesus, under Jesus' feet, and gave to him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the church, Jesus builds it up and he heads it up. Some people think, well, no, actually, it's the Pope. He's the head of the church. Some think, well, no, actually, it's the pastor. He's the head of the church. No, some people think, actually, it's the government. The government is the head of the church. Let me reply with three simple words. Nope, nope, nope. Jesus is the head of the church. So Jesus builds it. Jesus heads it. And Jesus commissions the church. 
If you're taking notes, you can jot down Matthew 28, verses 19 19 through 20. Jesus says to his disciples, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. To go and preach the gospel. To, to tell people about Jesus. To let mankind know that their sins can be forgiven. That no matter who you are or what you've done or where you're from, that God knows every single thing about you. He knows all the sins that you have ever committed and will ever commit. And he still sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. So that you might be forgiven of all of those things. That any guilt that you have might be removed. The condemnation might be done away with. That you would find the void in your life filled. That you would know the God who created you. Jesus commissions the church to go and to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Letting people know that there is a God in heaven who loves them, who sent his only son, Jesus, to die for them. That whoever would believe in in Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life. This is what we're to be doing. And Jesus gave our spiritual forefathers this great commission and it has been passed down to us today. What I read from in Matthew 28 is called the Great Commission. So Jesus, he builds the church, he heads the church, and he commissions the church. The church is not the building, the church is the people. It's the group of people, you and me, that gather together to worship the Lord. Gather together, thanking Jesus for what he has done for us, where our sins are forgiven. We praise the Lord. It was an amazing time. We're worshiping the Lord this morning. The group of people gathering together to lift up the name of Jesus. You know, as Rick had mentioned about feeling isolated and feeling alone and feeling that you're the only person dealing with the things that you've dealt with and and how coming to the family, coming to church, you realize that that's not the case, that there are other people going through the same thing. So Jesus gave our church forefathers this great commission, which leads us as we see what is the church, the gathering of Believers together to point number two, what is the role of the church? Now, this list could be exhaustive. People could go up and down and up and down about the church should be doing this and the church should be involved with this and the church should be doing this and that and the other thing and then the church should do this and then the church should do that. Well, actually, the role of the church is to preach the gospel and to make disciples. And yes, we'll use any platform that we can. If it means building a roof over somebody's head so that we can tell them about Jesus, we'll do it. If it means going and feeding the homeless to tell them about Jesus and his great love for them, we'll do it. We will use platforms to preach the gospel, but the church is not a humanitarian aid organization. The church is a gospel-presenting organization, a group of people that have been saved through faith in Jesus and go and tell other people about it. Remember... Last week, we asked the question, are you a container or are you a conduit? Do you only contain what God has done or are you allowing God to use you and let it flow through you so it's not only the Lord working in your life, but through your life? The church is meant to tell people about Jesus, to make disciples. Making disciples is at the very heart of the message of the gospel. To have people not follow me, Not follow you, but to follow Jesus. To follow him. To follow him. I mean, in the world today, there's just so much wishy-washiness, if you, you know, we can use that as 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 a word today. Where people don't stand for anything and they ping pong all over the place. Yeah, that sounds good today, but this sounds better tomorrow. And that's what I did last week. And people are all over the place. Following this thing and following that thing and following that guy, oh, that didn't work out. No, the Lord says to make disciples of him, followers of Jesus. But you might say, well, well why make disciples? Why, why make disciples? Well, how about because Jesus said to do it? How is that for us as the church? Or how about because it's the best and most sure way of growing the church and the kingdom of God being extended? How about because it works? 
Jesus gave us the example. Jesus taught, trained, and entrusted his disciples to go and do the same. The apostles did it, and they made many disciples. As we've been studying, Acts 5, verse 14, it says, Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. Acts 12, 24. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. And you can read that time and time again in the book of Acts. The disciples went out and made more disciples. That's why last week we said, hey, invite somebody that you know that needs to be in church. Because sheep beget sheep. Christians beget Christians. When you go out and you're not containing, but you are allowing the word of God to flow through you, it's evangelistic. And that's the heart of Jesus. It's the heart of the Lord. His mission for the church is not to go and do all these good things, which the church does building hospitals and schools and and bringing medical relief. And we do those things, but we're to tell people about Jesus. I mean, think about it practically. I mean, I could build a roof over somebody's head, but never tell them about Jesus. Have I done my job as the church? No, because someone will die in their sins with a roof over their head or drinking clean water or taken out of sex trafficking. They'll still die in their sins unless they know Jesus. We do these things. Yes, they're good. Yes, they're needed so that we can tell people about Jesus. We bring medical relief and maybe we heal somebody that had an infection because we have the right medical equipment and the right right antibiotics. But that person will eventually die one day even though they may have been cured from from a disease. The church's role is to tell people about Jesus and to make followers of Jesus. And on this mission to make disciples, God has raised up gifted individuals to help with the process of discipleship. Which leads us to the passage of scripture I asked you to turn to, Ephesians 4 verse 11. Paul writes and says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, for our limited time today, this morning, for our discussion, we'll be looking at three types of people that go to church as well as the supernatural progression that hopefully we will all be a part of. Remember at the beginning, have to, need to, want to. Let's look at people group number one, have to. This person feels forced or guilt-tripped or pressured or serving. You know, they they feel like they're serving their sentence at church. Why are you here today? Uh, Lost a bet to my mom. I have to be here today. You know, this person wouldn't stop twisting my arm, you know, so I figured if I go to church, then maybe, you know, they'll lay off. Or, you know what, I kind of feel guilty if I don't go to church. I just have to go to church on Sunday. I just have to do it. Otherwise, you know, I just con- I'm condemned and, oh, you miss church. For this person, going to church is like doing time. You know, you sit there and you nudge the person next to you and you're like, so, what are you in for? You know, like that kind of thing. This person hasn't found a church they like yet. They're forced to church, not into it, don't want to. The second group of people that we'll look at are the need tos. The need tos. It would sound like this. It would sound like this. I feel like there's something missing in my life. Or, you know, I've lost a loved one, or I've come to the end of my rope, or I need help, or maybe there's more to this life, or I'm in addictions, or I'm unhappy, or I feel empty, or, you know, maybe I need to get to know God, or, you know, I've had something happen in my life that's got my attention that has shown me that this life is short, and that things in this world pass away, and that there's got to be something afterwards. The need to's. I've come to the point where I need to go to church, man. Look at my life. I'm messed up. I, I, I got to go to church. I mean, you look at what happened in after, you know, the aftermath of September 11th, you know, 2001, where there wasn't a church in America that wasn't packed out and overflowing because something terrible happened and people's attention was turned to God and think, man, this is, you know, this is crazy. This is what happens. These are the need to's. You have the people forced, the have-tos, you have the people that need to. And maybe you're in one of those two categories this morning where you're here and you have to go to church. And that's the way you look at it. I have to be here. Or maybe you're here and you're like, I need to be here. Like I got all these things going on in my life. 
For this person, going to church maybe is seeking answers or seeking help. The third people group we look at are the want-tos. And this person would say, I have a desire to be in the Lord's house. I want to worship him. I want to hear from his word. I want to, I want to not only be ministered to, but I want to minister to his people. You know, I work my schedule around church. I don't work church around my schedule. No, I make sure that church is my priority, that I'm here, and I want to be there in the presence of God's people. There's not a greater place to be. I feel safe here. I feel loved here. I feel part of the family. I know that when I come to church, God's going to speak to me. I'm going to open up his word, and I'm going to learn something new that I can take with me and apply to my life. And, And church is exciting for me. I want to be here. I look forward to it. For this person, going to church is not only something they need spiritually, they do as obedience to God, but they truly desire to be in the house of the Lord. So which category do you fall in today? The have to, the need to, or the want to? Hopefully, if you're in the have to, you know, section, that you will transition into needing to, wanting to. If you're in the wanting to, or the, the need to section, that you would transition into, man, I want to be here. Because you'll find that God loves you, and you'll find that everything you need in this life can be found through Jesus Christ, who is the God who provides fill in the blank. Money won't fill that void. Relationships won't fill that void. Possessions won't fill that void. Partying, drugs, alcohol, sex, you name it. On this earth, there is not one thing that will make you feel content or happy. Jesus is the answer. He is the only one. And so if you're here seeking and you're like, man, what is there more to life? Yes, there is. And it's found through faith in Jesus Christ. If you've been invited by, by a friend and maybe you're in that have to stage right now, but you're kind of like, man, maybe I'm leaning more to like I need to. And, you know, maybe there, there are, you know, more things to life than, you know, what I'm currently doing. Good. Hopefully we'll all leave here this morning understanding our role. And so as we have seen, you know, point number one, what is church? Point number two, what is the role of church? We see number three, why church? Why? Why do I go to church? Well, if we take verses 11 and 12 of Ephesians 4, we would see that we go to church to be equipped to do God's work. We would see that we go to church to be built up in our faith And to be strengthened. To be strengthened. So church is for equipping and strengthening. That's what he says. That you equip the the pastors, the teachers, the, the evangelists are equipping you, the body of Christ. Strengthening you to do the work of the Lord. In verse 13, Ephesians 4, it says, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Stop right there. The standard is Christ, Jesus. So often we think the standard is a person that we're sitting next to. We think that the standard is, well, that guy is not that good and I'm better than him, so that means I'm right with God. Or I'm not as bad as she is. No way, Jose, man. That, whoa, did you see what she does? I'm way better than her, so, man, I must be good with God. No, the standard is Jesus for everyone. That's why the playing field's level. That's why there's no holy rollers, so to speak, where everyone's fallen short of the glory of God. No one's perfect. No one's arrived because we are not yet complete. We're striving for that. We're working towards that. The Lord's making us into that. But the standard is Christ. Verse 14, it says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So why do we go to church? Well, I lay out number one, to be equipped, to be strengthened. We go to church to be equipped to do God's work. We go to church to be strengthened in our faith. We go to church to be mature in the Lord, to be grounded in the truth. We go to church to be more like Jesus. Well, you might reply, well, you know, that's great. 
but I can do all of that stuff on my own. I can grow and I can mature and I can learn the truth and I can be strengthened and I can be equipped. You know, and besides, I don't need to go to church. Church is full of what? Everybody know that word? Everybody. Church is full of what? Yeah. Have you heard that ever before? I'm not going to church. Church is full of hypocrites. I love how Greg Glory replied to somebody who said that. There's always room for one more, buddy. Now, Greg wasn't justifying hypocrisy by any means, though we've all been hypocritical at times. However, that's not the reason to not attend a church. Church is imperfect because imperfect people attend church. And remember, church is imperfect because what's the church, the building? No, the people. And people are imperfect. That's the reality. But another reality is that if you love God, you will love his people. If you love God, you will love his people. You'll want to be in the presence of God's people. You'll want to be there, arm in arm, lifting up your voices, singing. You want to be there serving, you know, rubbing elbows together, lifting those things and praying for people and being involved with what the Lord is doing because he has commissioned the church to preach the gospel. Think of this analogy, if you will. Now, you're on the team of, of rock climbers, okay? You love extreme sports. And you guys decide, I don't know if you read in National Geographic lately about that team that, that scaled the highest peak of, uh, uh, of Yosemite. And we are here on a team. We're on a long line, okay? So there's numerous, you know, people on this rope, and we're climbing to the top. And you're about seven back or so, and then there's a bunch of people following you as well, okay? And, and you know, you got, you got everything you need. You know, you got your ropes. You know, you got your little carabiner clips. You know, you, you, got, you got your beanie. You know, you even got, you know, your, your outdoor, you know, adventuresome clothing on, you know, uh, when uh, your jackets and your boots and your spikes and your hammers and your gear and your chalk and you have everything. And you're climbing up. And then you're right there at the top, but there's this really difficult, like, lip that comes out. And so the guy that got up before you, as you're trying to climb up but can't, he sticks his hand down, grabs your hand, helps you over the lip. As the person before that guy helped him get over the lip, and the guy before that helped him get over the lip. But then when you get over the lip, you just unclip and you walk away. See you guys. Good luck down there. See ya. How would that make you feel? How, does that seem like that's messed up? Or does that seem like th th that's the right thing to do? Hey, I'm done, guys. Uh, I'm safe. I've arrived. See you later. That's not the way it's supposed to be. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, Paul writes, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, he says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord's return is drawing near. So we see that church is for equipping, equipping and strengthening through the teaching. But then secondly, we see that church is for fellowship, which is a vital aspect of why we as Christians go to church. Hebrews 10, 24. He says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. You do not have that fellowship when you're isolated and you're alone. I don't need to go to church. There's a bunch of hypocrites over there. Or it's, it's weird. Or I haven't found a place. Or whatever. You know, I'll just do my own thing. We are here in church to not only receive from the Lord but to give unto the Lord and to give unto others. Yeah, we come to church to receive, but remember, are we containers or conduits? We fill up, fill up, fill up, but we don't realize that it's meant to be a fill up to give out. In Hebrews 10, as I've already mentioned, it says to think of ways to motivate one another. 
Now, I don't know if any of you follow CrossFit. Uh, it's a pretty extreme uh, sport, uh, very competitive. The CrossFit games are coming up in July. I think it's like 21st to 25th. I used to do CrossFit for a couple of years, and most brutal workouts I've ever done. You know, you think, oh, yeah, I play college basketball. You know, I'm cool. And then you just are like vomiting and dying over there on the side. Uh, but one of the things that was really that popped in my mind when I, was, when I was reading this in Hebrews where it says, the church is meant to think of ways to motivate one another and to stir up one another to good works. That if you're doing this workout, you do it as a team. And if somebody finishes ahead of the other group, then they start cheering the other guys on. Come on, you can get it. You can get it. Come on, you do it. You do it. And then the next person finishes, and then he joins in. They start clapping, and then there's the guy over there, you know, the last person, which was me. You know, oh, I can't lift one more thing. Come on, don't be a girl. You know, like that kind of thing. Um, that's not really motivational. They didn't really say that. But, you know, uh, you know hey, it's, it's, the, it's the group. It's the team aspect of it. Come on, you can do this. The fellowship, the community, the relational aspects of this. See, some people want to go to a church that motivates them, but they don't want to motivate others. They want to attend a church. I'm going to go to church, and what do you provide for me? And I want to be motivated and stirred up, but they don't realize that I go to church to not only be motivated and stirred up and taught and equipped and strengthened, but to motivate and encourage and help and serve my brothers and sisters in Christ. I go to church for that fellowship. Some want to go to a church that will only motivate them, but they don't want to motivate others. He, Ephesians 4.16, he says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. The body of Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you're a part of the church, which is the body of Christ, which has many different members and different motions and different things that the body is supposed to do. I always remember, you know, Pastor Chuck saying, you know, something about the big toe. And he's like, I'm the big toe in the body of Christ. And it's damp and dirty and smelly in here. I don't want to be here anymore. So I'm going to go on the forehead. It's not the way it's supposed to be. For one, that person's not walking anymore. And for two, you don't want to have a toe sticking out of your forehead. The body of Christ works differently, but it's meant to work together. It's not what can I give, and I think, uh, what can I get uh, only? I, I think that this, and we'll talk about this in, in, you know, in the months to come in a different part of this series, but I think it even has to do with the consumer mentality of Americans today, where I go to only get something. But that's a secular environment. What do you provide for me? What do you do for me? How do you hook me up? How do you take care of my needs? What do you, you know? But then in church, it's not meant to be that way. In church, it's meant to be this cyclical, symbiotic uh, a relationship where the church helps each other and serves together and ministers to each other. This fellowship aspect is huge because the Lord says in his word, we'll read it again, verse 16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. When you're not involved with what is happening in the church, you are literally withholding your gift. You are withholding what you should be doing in the body of Christ. You are not allowing the body of Christ to function properly because you're saying, nope, this is my thing. I'm containing what I've been given, and that's it. Go ahead. You keep doing what you do for me, but that's where it stops. The body is meant to work together. It says as each part does its own special work. It's as if you're like maybe building a puzzle, right? Each one of us have a piece that are meant to, to put it into that puzzle so that the picture can be complete, but then some of us just say, nope, that's my piece. Come on, man, we're in this together. Everyone's putting their piece in. Look at the big picture. What are we trying to accomplish? The big picture of the church preaching the gospel, seeing people saved, becoming followers of Jesus, serving, working, investing in the work of God. It says as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. When you do what you're doing, it helps other people grow in their relationship with the Lord. So then you'll see this whole level of maturity raised at the church, in the church as a whole. Man, everyone grows because everyone contributes so that the whole body is what? I love this. Healthy and growing and full of 
love. Healthy, growing, full of love. Man, we want to be a healthy church. Maybe some of us have been to churches that are not healthy. They're not. There's no way around it. It's not a healthy church. Self-focus. People more concerned with what they're getting than what other people need. We want to be healthy. We want to grow. So far, the Lord's adding to his church. He's adding to Vision City Church every week. People are coming. More people are coming. Growing. We want to be healthy. We want to be growing. And we ultimately want to be full of love because we will know. They will know. We will know that we're Christians. They'll know that we're Christians by our love. So we see that church is for equipping and strengthening. Church is for fellowship. But then thirdly, church is obedience to God. You ask, well, why do I need to go to church? Well, you go to church to obey God. In Hebrews 10, 25, it says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. You hear people say, the Bible never says go to church. Yeah, but it does say don't stop going to church. Specifically, we go to church because it's obedience to God because the Lord says you need to go to church. You need to gather together with other believers. For some of us, going to church, it is not a priority. Remember, you know, we work church around our schedules instead of working our schedules around church as opposed to I work my schedule around my church and not the other way around. Like I make sure that what I do is, is based upon my spiritual my spiritual responsibilities and commitments first. We did that in my family. All of us brothers were competitive athletes. We all played college basketball, but we all played all-star teams and traveling teams and all that. And there would be times where they would call practices on Sunday mornings or they would have a game on Sunday morning. And it was a principle in our home that, sorry, we don't play on that day because that's the day or on that morning because that's the day we go to church. And if it's between basketball or church, then we choose church because that's what God's called us to do. It needs to be a priority. The Bible doesn't say in Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do unless it's amazing weather outside. Unless it's a great day to go to the beach or unless it's your day off. All right, don't neglect the gathering together of the brethren unless you're tired. Man, if that were the case, none of us would be at church. I'm the pastor. I feel like watching online from time to time. But I just couldn't. There's no one to be here teaching it. Oh, man, I can't go. Well, because you don't really need to worship God or learn the Bible or fellowship as much as those other Christians need that stuff. Uh, I don't need to go to church. It's not a priority. It's not a, it's not a thing that I'm committed to. According to the Christian Post, and I quote, studies show that if you don't go to church for a month, the odds are almost two to one that you won't go for more than a year, end of quote. Another study once disclosed this, that if both mom and dad attend church regularly, 72% of their children remain faithful in attendance. If only dad attends regularly, 55% of their children remain faithful. If only mom attends regularly, 15% remain faithful, and if neither, neither mom or dad attend regularly, only 6% remain faithful. Going to church is an act of obedience, but it sets the precedent for our homes, for our spouses, for our children. We go to church. It's a priority. I go to be equipped and strengthened. I go to fellowship, which means I have interaction with my brothers and sisters in Christ, not only to receive but to give. Remember, stirring one another up for good works. I mean, are we doing that? Do we have a desire to do that? Yeah, that sounds cool. I mean, how amazing is it when we're having a bad day and somebody comes out of the blue and gives us this word of encouragement and says, hey, man, it's okay. You know, or, or, or compliments us or, or says, you know, hey, can I pray for you? I've been thinking about you, whatever. And it boosts us up. What if we were all doing that to each other? What an amazing thing would happen in our church. Fourthly, we go to church for accountability. And, I, and I, if I could just say this frankly, uh, as a Christian, going to church helps you not get weird. Yes. For those of you who are like, wait, what did he just say? Well, I'd love to say this again. Going to church helps you not get weird. Helps you not get weird. 
When you're isolated, it's very easy to begin maybe even to rationalize sin, uh, to start thinking, you know, this is the way that life really is, or to go off doctrinally. See, being around Christians and being under the spiritual authority of the church, which is hopefully under the spiritual authority of God's word, which has come directly from the head of the church, which is Jesus, it sharpens us as Christians. Even as it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 27, 17. So that we're in this place of accountability. That's why we've instituted house groups for our midweek instead of having another service where we just keep growing and people slide in and out under the radar. No one talks to them. No one asks them how they're doing. We want to be a relational church as we grow. We don't want to lose that. Accountability is huge. Hey, man, I haven't seen you for a couple weeks, so your friend calls you. What's going on? Are you coming to church today? We miss you, man. Where have you been? Some of us don't want that accountability because deep down inside we know we should be there. And when someone calls us, it bugs us. And so we're like, oh, send the voicemail. Know what that's about. Text, delete. Oh, I never saw it, man. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, I must, you know, I don't know what happened. Must not have gone through or something. You know, bad service up here. You know, I don't know what it, or whatever it might be. We have accountability in the church. So that if we're off doctrinally, well, wait a second. I open my Bible, I'm like, that's, that's not what it says. I think maybe let's, let's talk about that. Oh, you're right, man. I was thinking, you know, I saw this guy on the Internet, on YouTube, and he said this, and I just thought this was right, but I didn't even look at it in the Bible. So it brings balance. It brings balance. Fifthly, and finally, and obviously this list is exhaustive, but I've picked five. We go to church for the Lord and for others. See, we need to correct the mindset or, or, yeah, we need to correct the mindset that, that we go to church for just ourselves. And as I already mentioned, it's like that consumer you know, mentality where it's like, I go to church to see what I can get out of it. So my motivation to go to church isn't, you know, okay, you know, God's told me I need to go to church. It isn't for fellowship. How can I interact with others? It isn't to be strengthened and equipped necessarily. It could be. But I'm more concerned my motivation is what do I receive? What do I get out of it? Can you see how that can be such a detrimental point of view for a Christian in the church? Where you're motivated by what you get out of it? I mean, that would never fly for relationships, would it? Interpersonal relationships, dating. I'm just in this relationship to see what I can get out of it. You'd be like, you jerk. How could you treat her like that? Or, you know, how could you treat him like, or, or whatever it might be? And you think, well, that doesn't work. Well, you're absolutely right. The proverbial light bulb just came on. Wait, it doesn't work. I go to church for the Lord, not for myself. I go to church for, the, uh, for other people. Our motivation for church attendance shouldn't be how it will bless me alone, but rather how will it bless God and how will it bless others? Do you realize that you're a blessing to the people next to you? You realize that? Well, I don't really feel like a blessing. No, you are. You are a blessing to the people next to you when you come to church. Why? Just the very presence there is a blessing to them. Wow. There's another person like me goes to church here. Whoa, I'm blessed by that. Jeez, I'm blessed that you're here. I'm the pastor. I see you guys. I'm blessed to see you here. We're blessed to see each other. But then more than that, we go to church to bless the Lord. It's not like I go to church to receive. I'm coming here. What do we do? We worship the Lord. We lift up our voices and we're singing praises to God. In Psalm 134, verse 2, it says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. That's what we do. Blessing the Lord. I've come here. Lord, I'm giving of my time that you've given me. You, you fill my lungs with the air to breathe. And Lord, I'm honoring you on this day where I am going to bless you, lift up my, my hands. I'm going to obey what you call me to do, which is to not skip out on going to church. I'm going to be here in the church. I'm going to worship you. I'm not going to only be here from what I get. Yeah, I get built up. I get encouraged. I get strengthened. I get blessed. But I want to bless other people. Lord, who do you have around me that I could pray with or that I could talk to or that I could help or that I could encourage? This is why we go to church. There are great blessings that follow us blessing the Lord. 
We come here, man, oh, bless the Lord, but we're blessed because we bless the Lord. We come in and worship him and we study his word. We're blessed. We're doing this to the, for the Lord and we're blessed because of it. The church. I'm coming here for the Lord. Lord, I want to worship you. I want to hear from you. I want to, I want to learn so that I can be better equipped to do the work of the ministry. Not to be more knowledgeable so I can contain all of this great knowledge and experience just to hoard it for myself. Hopefully, in closing, I had to use that word today for those of you that are have tos <laughs> this morning. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, great message, brother. That was awesome. Oh, okay. In closing, hopefully, all of us today, we will find ourselves heading in the right direction of progression when it comes to why church? Why church? Remember, we asked the question, well, I was born that way. I've always gone. It feels weird if I don't. feel guilt. I'm tripped or whatever it might be. That we will have that progression in our life where we go from having to go to church to needing to go to church to I want to go to church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this morning. We thank you, Lord that we were able to open up your word and learn and answer that question, why do we go to church? What is it all about? I pray, Father, that you would give us a greater understanding of our role as Christians, Lord, in fulfilling the role of the church and proclaiming the gospel and stirring each other up for good works. And, Lord, not only receiving but giving and serving and volunteering and committing and setting our priorities straight. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help us in that area. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you would continue to grow your church, that you would add daily, Lord, those who are being saved. And, Lord, bring those people in our path, Lord, that we can, we can serve and we can pray for and we can minister to and we can lead to you as, Lord, we're your disciples. We pray that there would be some major compound interest going on starting today with this church, which is this group of people following you and serving you. And so, Lord, give us ears to hear what your spirit would say Lord, as we close with worship, Lord, I ask that these things that we've learned from your word would sink deeply into our hearts. And Lord, that we would bear much fruit. And Lord, we pray specifically for those that don't know you, Lord, this morning that might be here. Lord, I pray, God, that they would put their faith in you and come to know you, Jesus. And with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here this morning and, and maybe you're in that category of like, man, I have to go to church because my mom or my dad makes may make me go or you know I have to go to church because I, I feel guilty if I don't but church isn't what it's supposed to be in your life maybe maybe you're at that point right now where you would even say well you know I might have gone to church but I've never committed my life to Jesus personally and I would even tell you that that's the very foundation that church changes when you're following Jesus with your whole heart church changes when when you have a desire to do the things that please God and so if you're here this morning and you've never personally put faith in Jesus, like maybe you know of him, maybe you say, well, you know, my parents are Christian, so that makes me a Christian, or I'm, you know, I went to Sunday school when I was younger or whatever, that doesn't make you a Christian. Making you a Christian can only be done through faith in Jesus. You're only made a Christian through faith in Jesus. And so with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here this morning and maybe you've never given your life to Christ, but you know that you've sinned and you know that you need you need that change. Maybe you've gone from having to to needing to. I understand, man, I need, I need that. I need that forgiveness. I need that love. I want that, that fellowship with God. Then with every eye closed and head bowed, I'm going to ask that if you like to give your life to Jesus and be forgiven of your sins, that you would just raise your hand wherever you're at and say, yes, that's me. I'd like to give my life to Jesus this morning. Amen. Anybody else? Raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you if you just raise your hand so I can see it. Right on. I see you over there too. Right on, guys. Anybody else? Going to church isn't just meant to be a routine. Going to church is something completely different than that. It starts with having a relationship with God. Anybody else, just raise your hand now. And also, maybe you've walked away from the Lord, and maybe, you know, you've been in sin, and you've been living a life where maybe, maybe you haven't been to church in a long time. And, and, and maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, what are the chances that this would be, you know, taught on this morning? Well, it's nothing to do with chance. It has everything to do with God's plan.
And he brought you here to hear this. And if you've walked away from the Lord and maybe you need to come back to him or recommit your life to the Lord, would you raise your hand as well and say, yes, that's me. I need to recommit my life to Jesus right now. You know who you are. Would you just raise your hand as well and say, yes, that's me. And I can lead you in that prayer as well. Anybody else, just raise your hand. And if you're watching online too, you can pray this prayer. Just mean it in your heart. Close your eyes, bow your head and say, dear Jesus, please, if you raise your hands today, say, dear Jesus, Forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me, even knowing everything about me, all my sin. I thank you that you died on the cross for me. And I thank you that you have forgiven me of all the wrong I have ever done. Would you fill me with your love and with your joy and with your peace and give me your strength that I may be who you've created me to be. For I give you control of my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for those that have made that commitment to follow you. And I pray, Lord, that now they would know he's a new man. He's a new woman. She's a new woman in Christ. The old things have passed away. All has been made new starting right now. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to live our lives dictated by the mistakes of our past, but Lord, we have a future and a hope found in you. So Lord, we pray for those that have made that commitment here in person, watching online, listening to this later. Lord, we ask God that you would strengthen them now as they start this new walk with you. And Lord, we pray for us as a church that we'd be healthy, that we'd be growing, and that we'd be filled with love. And that every part of the body would be doing Lord, what it's supposed to be doing, doing its part so that we all grow, so that we all are strengthened, so that we all are encouraged, and that we all mature. And Lord, that we're able to speak forth the truth and love. Lord, that we're able to not be tossed to and fro by lies that seem like the truth. But Lord, that we would be those men and women that you created us to be. And Lord, this is your church, and we are your people. And the work that takes place here is your work. And so, Lord, may your work and may your will be done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen.